Good evening and welcome to The Drive at 5 on intellectualradio.com slash iHeartRadio Station. I'm your host, Roman. We have a good show planned for you today. It's the new year, so don't forget to stay tuned to intellectualradio.com slash iHeartRadio Station for Warriors Talk at 6 p.m. with my girl, Rochelle. Tonight, my guest is an Emmy Award-winning journalist, an author, an associate professor at Chicago State University. You name it, he did it. Please give a drive at five welcome to the one and only Dr. Gerard McClendon. I appreciate you, Roman. Drive at five. Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> well, please give intellectualradio.com slash iHeartRadio Station your background. I, you, you just basically summed it up. You know, uh, uh, born and raised Hammond, Indiana. I uh, went to Wabash College, Valparaiso University, got a Ph.D. from uh, Loyola University, Chicago, uh, started to do television in Maryville, Indiana after that, and uh, uh, got got called up by WGNCL-TV when I was doing a show in Indiana called The Big Picture. And we did that show free for five years, my brother and I. And I always tell people, don't look for the come up. Just get good and get better at what you do. The come up will happen. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, Steve Farber, the uh, GM at the time of CLTV, called me and said, we think we want to do a show with you called Gerard McClendon Live. And uh, and so then, you know, media was born from that point. Uh, simultaneously, I was doing a show at WVON in Chicago as well. And so that's me in a nutshell. You know, there's there's it's a multifaceted life. But, uh, you know, my two main loves, of course, are my family. And then after that, it's media and education. Let's speak on that. You are an associate professor at Chicago State University teaching education policy. What inspired you to go from journalism to teaching at a collegiate level? So I started teaching long ago. I taught at the high school level in Indianapolis for a few years beginning my career after Chicago, after, uh, after college. And then I taught at Culver Military Academy in Indiana for about five or six years. Uh, I've always been a teacher, you know, uh, ever since I was eight years old, God basically spoke to me and said, I'm going to give you the ability, Gerard, to explain very complex things in a simple way. I've known that since I was eight years old. And so all of the times I tried to run away from being a teacher, an educator, a professor, that calling just kept calling me back, reeling me in, saying, nah, whatever. But you don't seem like a person to run away from anything. I think we all run away sometimes from our gifts because we don't think they're, they're real all the time. We don't think that the calling is real. Sometimes you have to be placed in a situation where you deny your gift to see what your gift truly is. And so once I started teaching on the high school level, on the college level, on the seminar level, I started to realize that this gift was real and that I could not deny it anymore. The media is a sidebar. Me doing radio and television, that's just to make my audience bigger. Because when you teach in a classroom, you only have access to a, a limited number of students, right? Finite number of students. But once you get in media, that audience gets bigger. And so that's what God gave me. God said, okay, hey, teaching is cool, Gerard, but you may only have 125 students a year. But with media, you may have 125,000 people that you're speaking to. So we have to hold on to those gifts and not deny them. You have multiple books out there. One in particular is called President's Thug. Mm -hmm. Thugs, I'm sorry. Tell us about that. <laughs> and you're laughing already. So tell us about it. Because you don't 
present yourself to have a title like that? President Thug is about Donald Trump. You know, all throughout that administration, I realized how this country failed to choose and to elect a leader that was meant for the position. We chose this country chose racism, sexism, classism. This country chose so-called elitism. And throughout that administration, I became angrier and angrier. And it hit me at two in the morning one night. Gerard, write a book about it. Write a book about Donald Trump, President Thug, and equate it to Dante's Inferno. So my book, President Thug, basically shows the equivalence between Donald Trump and Dante's Inferno. If people are not familiar with Dante Inferno, mm -hmm. let them know about it. So if you ever read the epic poem, Dante's Inferno, it talks about the realms of hell and what you will go through in hell depending on the sins you commit while you're here on this earth. And Donald Trump commits every sin imaginable, and we picked him as a leader. That shows you right there that the United States of America as a whole does not care about the lesser of these. It does not care about the least of these. It does not care about the downtrodden, the poor. It doesn't care about the misfortunate things that people go through on a day to day basis. We elected a leader that was grossly inadequate. And that's what we talk about in President Thug. Do you consider him as a leader? No, no, not a good leader. Uh, Hitler, Hitler was a leader, right? But what is your definition of a leader? It just seems like when you go through every ethnicity, they have a different definition of what a leader should be. Mm -hmm. African-Americans, at least what I have, have a different definition of a leader in comparison to a white person, mm -hmm. in comparison to a Hispanic or other ethnicities, even other religion. So define leadership. A good leader is a servant leader. A good leader doesn't even look at him or herself in the capacity of being a leader. A good leader looks at him self or herself as a servant. How can I serve you? How can I help you? How can I get you out of a downtrodden state or an uneducated state or a hungry state? Can I get you from lack to abundance? That's what a leader does. A leader doesn't do it for him or herself. That's where Donald Trump fails. But uh, in, you know, comparison, you know, in comparison to that, not only Donald Trump, mm -hmm. if you're using that definition, you're looking at Chicago politics, aldermen, mayors, you know, state and citywide officials, not only just in Chicago, but all over. They think that you got to have swag. Yeah. You got to have some. You, you you got to have the look. You got to be thug. You got to be bowdy bowdy. Yeah, and sometimes you do to get the position. But that's just it. The position. If the position doesn't move you into a state of servant leadership, it's worthless. It's empty. Whether you'll be voted out or not, that is according to what the people say. The the politic, the body politic, the policy. But a good leader. Doesn't but really, but but, and I'm sorry to cut you off, mm -hmm. but that's what what ticks me off. That's not leadership. Policy is leadership. Yeah, resources. If person provides a resource, that's leadership. Relationship. That's leadership. When somebody sits there and say it's about your dress, your your clothes, yeah. your swag. You got to look the part. Service. You got to do this. You got to you got to talk the talk. You got to walk. The, you got to be, you know, right. you got to know some game members off of 63rd and Cottage. Sometimes that's the case, though. 
you know, leadership can be surface, but if you don't have an agenda other than a surface agenda, it's empty. Sometimes you need swag to become a leader and to help change things because true leadership also has to make sure that it is a part of the culture. So I'll give you an example. But don't you think that's part of the problem, what we're having now? It depends. With, with, it, with, because if it, if you look at African-American leadership right now, mm -hmm. in comparison to Hispanic leadership, in comparison to white leadership, we're lagging. We're behind. You think so? Yes, we you, are. You really think so? I think we are. Because if you look at our neighborhoods, mm -hmm. in comparison to Hispanics, Hispanic, they don't have food deserts in Hispanic neighborhoods. African-Americans, they do. But is that because of the leadership or is that because of the state that the people think they are in? And we also have to look at systematic and systemic racism, redlining. We have to look at, look, look at the Dan Ryan. The Dan Ryan Expressway was built on the platform of racism. How can we divide the city? Nobody ever talks about that, you know, and, okay, let's, and, let's and, 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 about when, and when you look at uh, loans, for instance, you know, if you've got a if you're black and you have a 650 credit score, you're going to be limited. If you have a 750, you might even be limited. That's where you have to not get angry. You have to get smart. And, and so we can't always call upon this mythical black leader to save us. We can't always call for Dr. King and X and Moses and Jesus to solve our problems. Some of that stuff is within, Roman. Okay. It, it goes within <laughs> this quote that I did last year with T.O. Hardiman. You're a good friend, my good friend. Mm -hmm. T.O. Hardiman, we had a, did a show on this quote called Bootstrap. Dr. King was presented a question. And he said, and I quote, okay, uh, blacks will pull up their bootstrap, but first provide us the doggone boot. Yeah. The problem is we don't have the boot in some of these areas. Yeah, that's true. So how can, if you vote a leader in and they supposed to provide a boot and they get six figures, I understand they got personal issues, stuff mm -hmm. like that, that they have to take care of. But come on. Yeah. Now. But th here's another thing. In the black community, we have to stop looking at leaders as just elected officials. Because sometimes an elected official is just out for himself. So often they're out for themselves. And real leadership is cultural and it's on the block level. It's not always on the neighborhood, city, or state level. It's on the block level. Before Gerard McLennan or Roman can complain about black leadership, we have to make sure that our gutters are clean. We have to make sure that our sidewalk is clean, our grass is cut on our block. We have to encourage others on our block to do the same so the property value doesn't drop. That has nothing to do with the aldermen whatsoever. Nothing. It's about self-respect and character and integrity and dignity. That's what has to be taught in the community. Politicians going to do what they're going to do. They're only going to do what you make them do. Make me do it. Lyndon B. Johnson said that to Martin Luther King. I don't know if I can do that for you, Martin. Sign this civil rights bill. I don't make, he said, make me do it. Martin. This is what we have to do with local so-called politicians and elected officials. You got to make them do stuff or vote them out until but they, they get an attitude when you make them do something. The, the problem is we don't you have a trouble waker, Roman Morrow. We don't have we don't have it, it, what, what, when your neighborhood is voting at a 30 percent clip. The politicians got it made. It, because it's easy to be an incumbent and to win election after election if only three out of 10 people are voting. And it's just like the you go to a friend's house. They got a bulldog. Every time you go to your friend's house, you see the bulldog in the corner laying, you know, moaning. Uh, and you go to your friend's house. You're like, dude, why is your dog always moaning when I come over here? Uh, oh, he just laying on a nail. 
laying on a nail. Why is your dog laying on a nail? Because it doesn't hurt bad enough for him to get up. That's the black community. We don't hurt. We think that trash on the street is okay. We think that homicides in the trash neighborhood on the street is because they know somebody from city services and they say, oh, well, they need the job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. But the bottom line is property values are going to drop if your stuff is nasty, if your stuff is grimy. And we have to start stop comparing ourselves to anything else but ourselves. How can we get better? By knowing what's better. See, so look at Martin. Let's look at Martin Luther King. We're coming up on that day. Let's look at King. King didn't care about finances so much that Coretta Scott King used to always get in arguments with him about that because he couldn't take care of the family financial. King was a servant leader. King had the equivalent of a $50,000 Nobel Peace Prize and he gave the money away. Think about that. How many leaders today would give away 50,000 then, the equivalent to close to a half a million dollars now for winning a Nobel Peace Prize? Especially very, if they very, have a sister wife saying, you must be out of your, you know what, mind. And, with four, that money away. and with four kids and your house has the threat of being bombed. That's leadership. Sure, King has some flaws. He had some infidelities, all right? But he was a servant leader. He knew he was going to die. He said longevity has its place, but I've been to the mountaintop. I've seen the promised land. But today, mm, you're not really seeing that. The, <laughs> other, the other book is entitled Ask, Ask, A-X, or Ask. Tell me about that book. Acts or Ask, the African-American Guide to Better English was, was written because I saw that there were hundreds, if not thousands of black people, especially students, missing out on opportunities because of the simple mispronunciation of words. Acts. You know, uh, 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 and I've got plenty of examples in the book um, among, between, you know, uh, numbers, uh, kindergarten for kindergarten, jury for jewelry, lackadaisical for lackadaisical. All right. The list goes on and on. I wrote that book not to condemn black people, uh, uh, but to show you that mispronouncing a word in a job interview, even though you may be the most qualified candidate, it could kick you out of an opportunity. It happens so much for our people. It's beyond skin color, right? It's beyond gender. It's but a, some people can debate you on that. Debate me on what? On, on some of the words. Okay, you got harassment. Some mm -hmm. people pronounce it harassment. Mm -hmm. Some people pronounce it harassment. Mm -hmm. Tomato, tomato. Mm -hmm. you, you got those words out there. So who's right, who's wrong? Who's wrong are the people who discriminate against those who use words in a situation where they can use the mispronunciation of a word for power. It doesn't matter how you say a word, right? But it matters how someone views you saying a word. That's the difference. That's the difference. Once again, you can have a master's degree, go into an interview, say ax instead of ask. And they're like, nope, not qualified. And you're the most qualified. Black people have to bear the brunt of that more than any other ethnic individual. Sad. That's why I wrote the book. Have you received some pushback? On oh, that? of course. Of course. But, Once. you know, I don't care about pushback when I'm trying to save people. <laughs> I don't care about pushback. Sexism, racism, classism, it's always going to be here. But there are ways to maneuver in this society to complete your goal. You know, uh, it doesn't it have anything to do with selling out either. You know, a chameleon, for instance, changes color to avoid being prey. And to be a predator, right? It doesn't change into another animal. It's still a chameleon, but it's changing color to survive. 
There are times, look, the average person changes dialect eight times per day. I talk to my wife in a different way than I talk to Roman. I talk to Roman in a different way than I talk to my children. I talk to a two-year-old in a different way than I talk to my supervisor. So we're always moving in and out of this thing called language is fluid. And the more facility and expertise that you have with language, the more opportunities you can garner. Do you think language is subjective? Of course it's subjective because it's language. But when someone discriminates against you for using language, that's the highest form of subjectivity. And so I'm just trying to show people that even though it's subjective, there are ways of getting around that. One of the most um, popular books that you have is the Dunda's Rules. Please give us a brief synopsis of that book because this is Kanye's West mother. Mm -hmm. That What inspire you to write the book? I did some research on it and it says, quote, that it's a composition of her theories, rhetoric, and resolution on Ebonics, a community-based economic development plan, and studies on Alexander Pushkin's. The book highlights her scholarly genius, as you put it. So tell us about the book and what inspired you to write Dunder's Rules. Bless her soul. You know, we miss her much. Uh, Dr. Donda West, uh, Dr. Donda Claire Ann Williams West, her full name, um, was a professor at Chicago State. I met her years ago before Kanye just blew up um, and became the star that he is. But very few knew that Dr. West was this pinnacle scholar all right, of systems theory and rhetoric. Um, she was the kind of woman in her scholarly works that showed how language cannot be separated. It's just not a phoneme or a meme. It's about meaning. What does a sentence mean? Not, not what are the words in the sentence. What does a sentence mean? What does a word mean? What does a paragraph mean? And in Donda's rules, we point out the 70 rules that Dr. Donda West would go through with her students so that they could understand systems theory and rhetoric. All systems theory and rhetoric means is that language is a system, which you just mean, which you just mentioned earlier. It can be subjective, but it's still a system. And this is what Dr. Donda West would point out. Can you give us a brief synopsis what that system is? So, a system of language has to do with what is said isn't always what the speaker means, but what is said has to be interpreted. This is where Donda West comes in. She says, you have to speak in a way that the audience can understand you and so they can understand your point so that both of you see things in an equivalent manner. If, if I'm speaking to an audience and they don't know what I'm saying, I failed as a communicator. Systems theory says there's a system to communication. There's a way to communicate. Uh, when I talk to my two-year-old nephew, for instance, there's a way that I have to communicate with him so he can understand what I'm saying. There may be certain words I cannot use because he's 24 months old. There may be a certain tone that I cannot use because he's 24 months old. But for someone 20 years old, it may be different. For someone who's a scholar, I may use a different type of vocabulary. So this is what Donda West would talk about. Craft your language to the point where you understand the systematic theory of the language to become a better communicator. Dr. West really wasn't recognized for her academics and her scholarly work. Do you feel some type of way about that? That's why I wrote the book. You know, Roman, I think that's a great question you just asked right there. And I think that you just summed up the essence of why I wrote the book. 
when people would say, oh, Kanye's mom was this scholar and this professor at Chicago State, and she was part of the Black Arts Movement with Hakeem Adabuti and Brenda Green, Dr. Brenda Green, you know, uh, uh, and, and the many others, Mahalia Ann Hines, you know, uh, uh, Common's mom, uh, uh, Joyce Ann Joyce, uh, my good friend, rest in peace, Conrad Worrell. You know, Donda West was a part of that crew, that black literature movement, that black writers movement in the 80s, 90s and in the 2000s. And I felt that her scholarly works had to be eventually put into print or else we would just totally forget about her. You know, before her untimely death, about a year, a year before her untimely death. I said, why haven't, you know, how has anyone published your works? And she said, Gerard, why don't you do it? Five years later, we come out with Donda's Rules. We mined 300 pages of her scholarly works. We found over 100 recordings of her speeches. We found annotated. We had the information. We had anecdotes. We, we hired interns to help us find all of this material in the archives. And uh, and lo and behold, we, we put the book together. And it's my love letter to Donda West. It's my love letter to Mr. Kanye West. And the, the purpose is to show that we as African Americans, we have to make meaning for each other and we have to make meaning for the world. Without this book, there's a there's a lot of meaning that we would never know about because Donda West eventually became overshadowed by her son. Speaking of her son, some people don't know you have a relationship with he or Kanye West. You met him recently before the holidays and you it was posted online. How is he holding up, given the nature of what's going on in his personal life? So I don't talk to Kanye every day. Uh, I consider myself more an acquaintance to Kanye. Um, when he calls or his manager calls, I always pick up and give whatever advice they want to hear from me. But as far as what Kanye does um, is what Kanye does. I don't speak for him. But when he asks for advice or he's like, Gerard, let me you know, run something by you. I'm more than glad to be there for him, you know, uh, as far as commentary on some of his actions, you have to ask Mr. Kanye West about his actions. When I was with him, when he was working on the uh, Donda album and when he was working on the Gap collection and the Balenciaga collection and the Adidas Yeezy collection, our conversations were magical. We had a good time. You know, he took me out to lunch and dinner every day. Uh, this was in California over a year ago. And uh, it was magical. We had a really, really good time. Uh, but uh, when, when, when Kanye wants to speak with you, he'll speak with you. And when he doesn't want to speak with you, he won't. <laughs> That's period. Hey, you have to give artists the flexibility and freedom to be artists. We can't expect artists to fall into a mold of the everyday nine to five worker. We can't expect that. They're artists, they're creators. And so sometimes creators don't look like everyone else or think like everyone else because they're in this quest for something new every day. That's Kanye West. Yee's mother worked at Chicago State along with yourself, mm -hmm. and she's an educator. This was said over and over and over again. He said he doesn't read books. A lot of people saying, I find that very hard to believe because your mother was a scholar, a doctor. How? And you have this knowledge in your head. Kanye likes attention. All right. Just like Donald Trump, just like Kanye West, just like anyone who's trying to get attention and to control the news cycle and media cycle of the Internet on a daily basis to promote their product. Sometimes people say things. Um, Kanye has been around books his whole life. 
He's read books his whole life in the last few years. But why would he and, say that? Well, to get a rise. It makes it. He controlled the news cycle for four days with that statement. Everyone paid attention. That was his goal. So you think <laughs> he's saying things to get attention or publicity to promote a new album, a single or a book? That's what people do with Instagram, TikTok. That's what people do with Twitter and Facebook. They, they, but they. Knowing they, him, you don't believe that in one one cent. No, heavens, no, no. Mm -mm. He's had privilege of having someone read something for him, and then they can report to him. So, for instance, he's read excerpts of Donda's Rules. But when he flew me out, he wanted to hear more about the book and more about his mother as a scholar. And he wanted to hear it from me, the secondary source. Instead of anyone else. Absolutely. Because this book isn't about me having an interpretation on Kanye West or on Donda West. This book is about getting Donda West's works out to the world so that people can see them, study them. Uh, the book is in school systems now. There are some college professors on the East Coast using it in their uh, composition classes. Are they using it in Chicago State? Not yet. Not yet. And why Not is that? Yet. I've used it in my introduction to teaching class, uh, Education 1520, to show people systems theory of Donda West. I've used it for that. Uh, but I don't think anyone else has adopted it yet. But uh, New York University, uh, there are some professors at Hampton University that are using the book. And so we're, we're very happy with that. What do you know about Yi? that people are missing or misinterpreted about him that should be out there regarding his character. Kanye West is one of the most sensitive people that I know sensitive in that he is passionate about art, very passionate about art. If he sees a certain color palette, he may become happy or sad to see that. If he hears a certain song, he's touched by that. I, I, I realize that more, the more time I got to spend with him, the more I realize that this is an individual who is, he's kinesthetic. He is, um, he's the kind of person that sees how certain things fit into rhythm and movement he 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 has this uncanny ability to know what people like you know and how to create it you know uh and we saw that especially with the first three albums we saw that we saw it with the clothing lines we see it with the shoes you know he has this ability to to be sensitive about artistic formats. If he sees a painting on a wall, he may sit there five or six minutes and just look at it. These are the intimate things that people don't know about Kanye West. As an associate of Kanye West or Ye. Yay. Yay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, why I'm calling him Ye for so? <laughs> it's okay. Yay. My bad. Yay. One of the things is about trust that I've noticed about Kanye. Ye. Yeah. Yay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you think he trusts you? Yes. As an associate? Oh, most and, and trusts you what you do and with books or something like that? Do you think that he'll call you up like he did recently and say, I would like you to write my biography? Well, would I, you? I would strongly consider it. If he would ask something like that, you know, but I would have to be brutally honest in terms of, is this for you? Is this for the world? Is this a truthful thing that you're trying to uh, get out to the world? Um, you know, I trust him in that matter. I think he trusts me when he calls. I give him my unadulterated, uh, you know, unfiltered opinion about things that he's doing. 
You were on CLTV and other media outlets giving your analysis on Chicago politics and more. A lot of people want to know what happened to you. Stop giving political analysis on television. And is it the Chicago media just said we had enough of Dr. McClendon? I think or it was, it was it something else? It was a perfect storm. I think at the time I was completing my doctorate at Loyola. And so that was taking up an enormous amount of time for me while doing Gerard McClendon live on CLTV. Um, the network and I had a few disagreements, uh, but because I was trying to finish up that dissertation, that took up a lot of my time. And I said, it's time to make a pivot here or and something's going to have to give. Uh, once I finished, I, I, I left CLT BWGN. Once I finished the dissertation at Loyola in 2010, I began my I taught I taught first at college, um, uh, Purdue University, came at College of St. Joe, and then Chicago State. I started teaching at Chicago State in 2011 after I got my doctorate from Loyola. So it was the dissertation that was the fulcrum for everything at that moment. I went on to do more TV shows after the doctorate was out of the way and while I was teaching at WYCC off 63rd with Gerard McClendon and Counterpoint with Gerard McClendon at Lakeshore Public Television. At that time, you realize that this is who you are. You're an educator. You're a media, I, I would say a, a media guru, so to speak. Now you want to get back out there again. What led you to say, you know what, I want to get back out there. Again. There's voices that need to be heard. And those voices that need to be heard aren't. Um, we live in a time right now where the famous are dominating, regardless of what they have to say. And many of what famous people say is totally insignificant as it pertains to the well-being of everyday people. That's what I want to get back to in the event we do another television show, uh, which is in the works now. And I'm excited about that. And I'm also working on a documentary uh, that focuses on ending violence in the United States. And so that has become my calling over the last few years? How can we reduce crime and not just do it through policing? When you reduce crime, it has to be multifaceted. It's not just money. It's not just policing. It's not just jobs. It's a mindset that has to be used. And we can use algorithms. We can use machine learning to help us to eradicate crime in communities. So I want to do media that deals with the eradication of violent crimes. You won an Emmy award for your documentary that aired on PBS TV on the challenge of raising black boys. Tell us about the documentary and do you see an improvement now, even though it was years ago in the challenges of raising black boys I don't, today. I don't see much improvement because schools haven't improved. And until schools improve, you won't see African-American males get to the level of greatness of where they should be. You know, when you're looking at 20 and 30 percent graduation rates for black males, you can expect crime to go up. Because And it's not just about education and jobs and bad policing. It's about hope. If I wake up in the morning and don't have any hope, I'm probably going to commit a crime. I'm probably going to do something out of pocket to make ends meet. And until we get to that point where we can look at eradicating crime from a multifaceted level, we're through. We're done. Do you think... It's the influence. I said this over and over on the drive at five. 
the influence of the internet, the music, or gaming that contributes to the problem of raising black boys. Do you also agree with that assessment? Not necessarily. Why? No, because I think that strong cultural forces like good parenting, uh, good siblings, strong neighborhoods can trump media that tries to block that. I truly believe that. But you're uh, let, inundated let, let me, with let, it. Yeah, okay. So is Japan. But Japan's homicide rate isn't as high as the homicide rates in large cities in the United States of America. Because even though Japanese children devour anime, violent anime, every day, they know the difference between the anime and real life. And, and they don't kill people. See, see, so when people say, oh, it's in the music, it's in the movies, it's in the, mm, mm -mm, that's a scapegoat. You know, check your resources, check your research when it comes to blatant media affecting people. You know, uh, just because a person watches a violent movie doesn't mean they're going to go out and kill people. Some people just want to enjoy a violent movie. <laughs> well, some here's people... a, here's another contradiction. Okay, in the United States, violence is accepted, right? In movies, you know, Rambo, uh, Schwarzenegger, and Stallone, they used to be their pride was to be able to kill more than thirty people in a movie, right? In America, violence runs everything. In European countries, you see more sex. Here's the crazy part, the contradiction. When Americans see sex on TV, they think it's disgusting. But when they see violence on TV, they accept it. <laughs> That's problematic. You lost both of your parents <laughs> in a home invasion. What memories would you like to share about your parents. I know it's a very sensitive, but you are willing to discuss it and discuss what happened. Before we run out of time, I would like to give that opportunity to My you. parents were two of the most beautiful people, meek, mild-mannered individuals you'd ever meet in your life. Uh, my brothers would say the same thing, you know, raised us to be uh, lovers of education, readers of books. And, uh, it's just it's it's just a horrible story to get a phone call while you're about to go on air to hear that your parents have just been murdered in a in a home invasion and that their bodies were dumped in a forest preserve. That's frustrating. That that's horrifying. Uh, that's a nightmare. And it shouldn't have happened. And uh, the two young men, African American uh, boys, of course, they're men now received 120 years in prison each, you know, but my parents being killed is a, is a horrible story. It's sad. But the fact that two young men, a 17 year old and an 18 year old would do this, that's just as sad. Where were the opportunities for those two young men to not think that they could hit a lick on my parents on their 54th wedding anniversary weekend? That's what we have to start working on. How can we give hope to someone who would do that and to say, no, I shouldn't do that because the McClendons are good people. I shouldn't do that because it's not right for me to steal or kill or harm people. When I forgave the perpetrators on the news, police received 130 tips and then that's when they started to hone in and find the perpetrators. And so, you know, um, there's always sunshine, you know, at the end of a rainy day, which may create a rainbow. And that's what we're trying to do through the Milton and Ruby McClendon uh, Memorial Scholarship Fund and through trying to let people know that in their lives, they have to forgive Roman. You got to let stuff go. Because for a year, I was in a fog, man. I was in a deep depression. But when you forgive, 
you release that pressure. It's not about the person that you're forgiving. It's about you forgiving for yourself. Because I know for a fact that if I wouldn't have if if I wouldn't have forgiven the perpetrators, perpetrators, uh, I wouldn't be able to get out of bed to this day. What is your definition of forgiveness? At a certain point in certain times, people have different versions of forgiveness. Some people think what I will tell you my definition. If I forgive you, it's a clean slate. It's a blank piece of paper. Mm -hmm. We're going to start all over again. Some people say, I can forgive you, but from afar. Others will be, I'm going to retaliate, then I'm going to forgive you. What is your definition? Uh, the great quote, forgiveness is the sweet smell that comes from a flower after the heel has crushed it. <laughs> so even though you can crush a flower, the flower forgives you by doing what? Giving you a sweet smell. That's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness says, let it go. It doesn't mean that I didn't want people to be prosecuted. Of course, they need to be prosecuted. But as far as them, their actions holding on to my heart for the rest of my life, mm -mm, that's not going to happen. Talking about journalism, and you've been in journalism for quite some time, do you think Chicago journalism has changed for the better or for the worse? Hmm. Wow. Great question. I don't think it's gotten better or worse, but there needs to be more investigative reporting. That's what's lacking in Chicago. Good, strong investigative reporting. Here's the rub, though. To have good investigative reporting, you need finances. And if your finances aren't thick and heavy, it's hard to find good reporters that will do that investigative reporting. So I'm not going to mention any uh, outlets, but there are some outlets in Chicago who do investigating re investigative reporting on a high level. And because they're funded well, they just do it better. Whereas there are other news agencies that don't put the money into investigative reporting. Therefore, you don't get good reporting. So. If, if we spend resources on good, strong, investigative reporting, journalism can save face in Chicago. The reason I say that is because the mayoral election is coming up. And a lot of people, and I talk sidebar off, the, off air, and I ask this question. Do you know the policies of each of the candidates that's running for Mayor of Chicago, none of them. Then why Chewy has 25%, Brenda Johnson, 25%. The rest, 15, 10%. Any questions on that? That's the body politics fault. Like the, like the voter needs to research the candidate. That has nothing to do with news agencies. Uh, you can go to Ballotpedia. You can go to Ballot Ready. You can go to those websites and you can find out intricate details about candidates. You know, the information's out there. The question is, do you want to get it? Or do you just believe in smear campaign television commercials that you see uh, and that you'll be inundated with before the election? Or are you actually going to research the candidate? Do you think the media is giving candidates a pass, so to speak? What do you mean by pass? Well, pass on critical issues concerning topics like crime, education, and economics issues in Chicago. They, they, you listen to some of these debates. Hmm. And these are, I hate to say it, I respect the journalists, but these are softball questions. It's fluff. It's fluff. You know, my college professor would say, fluff. You're giving me fluff. Give me something that is substantial. Once again, even during some of these debates, the reporters don't have the time or the resources to ask in-depth questions. They just don't. 
Uh, they can't even ask follow ups because the, the those debates are funded by for profit organizations and they want their ads to run during the debate before or after. So they can't do a deep dive. Unless you have a good muckraker somewhere or unless you have a good investigative reporter that's going to ask questions. There's no reason why a Santos should be in the Congress. Right. But there wasn't investigative reporting that would keep that particular individual out of office and tell the constituents that the person was phony. Now he's in Congress. It's the same with city politics. It's the same with state government. It's the same with school boards and planning commissions. If there isn't a deep dive and if the body politic, the voters, if the voters aren't researching it, you're going to end up with mediocre candidates for the rest of our existence. We're almost running out of time. Tell us what's coming up in the coming months for Dr. McClendon. Doing some research on expectations and we're doing research on expectations of teachers who view black English or African American English dialect or Ebonics as a negative or derogatory dialect. We've done two states so far. We're going to be doing the third state this year, which will be California. That's on the horizon. And then of course my, uh, my film forgiving Kane uh, will be out this year as well. Can you give us a brief synopsis on that? The Forgiving Cain film is about ending violence in the United States and how forgiveness becomes the weapon of healing that we all need to get through violent circumstances. You mentioned ending violence. Do you think it's curbing violence, the solution, or will it end violence? It can end. It can end. But it takes volition. It takes political will. It takes strong character. I believe in those things. I believe in the human spirit. I really do. But can we do it? We have to at least believe it. Believe that we can end it instead of curbing it. I am my ancestor's greatest dream, right? Yeah, you are. Yeah, the, an <laughs> the ancestor said we can get out of slavery. Some of us still have mental shackles, but it's okay because we have hope. Please give intellectualradio.com slash iHeartRadio Station where they can get your books, get in contact with you, and other stuff that you want to promote. Roman, quickly, uh, GerardMcClendon.com is the website, and you can also hit me on all social media outlets, Gerard McClendon or Gerard MC, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Okay, and your books? Yes, books you can get from GerardMcClendon.com as well or on Amazon.com. All right. You're not going to be a stranger to the Drive at Five, are you? No. Okay. Roman Mar, <laughs> it's been a plum, please, and pleasure. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Dr. McClendon, thank you for joining us. That's going to do it for us on the Drive at Five on IntellectualRadio.com. Thanks to Earl Winfrey, our executive producer. Wanda's behind the scenes. You guys have a wonderful week. <laughs>